Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the show. My name is Johnny Ball and I'm a professional speaker and a persuasive presentations coach who also happens to be somewhat obsessed with the tools and psychology of influence and persuasion. With a show that started off as a Toastmasters project, this is an international club where anyone can come and learn and practice their public speaking skills to over a year and a half later still having a great time marrying my two big passions in life of public speaking and persuasive psychology. As a lifelong learner myself, I hope that this show enables you to become an ever more powerfully persuasive and better paid speaker. One of the topics that we haven't really covered on the show is influence in the boardroom. And it certainly is an area that many people might have interest in. If you're already serving on a board, if you have served on a board, or if you are thinking that that might be something you would like to have in your future, my guest today has a great deal of experience, not just in serving on boards, but on how to influence in the boardroom. And she's here today to talk about that. Now, I have no interest at all in being on any kinds of boards. I never have served on a board. And yet I found this conversation really interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to my guest. She has some great expertise and it's always a pleasure to talk to someone who is very smart, knows what they're talking about and gives some really good, useful, valuable answers to the questions. So I hope you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show that's all about empowering tomorrow's influential speakers and leaders today. Many podcasters now agree that live streaming is the future of podcasting. If you want to get started with live streaming, my recommendation and the channel I use is Restream.io. Check the link in the show notes and after your first live stream, you will receive a $10 Restream cashback. Today, one of the big things I'm having a focus on in the show is much more on the influence and persuasion side of things. And I have an incredible guest today who is able to talk to us about influence in the boardroom, which I think is something that we were just saying before we started. I don't think anyone else is really out there talking about that. So it's great that she's here. If you ever are likely to be finding yourself in boardroom situations, or you currently do, this is an episode that you will not want to miss. So let me, with no further ado, welcome Judy Garland McClellan to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real delight to have you. You, you are someone you have, you have something like over seventeen years, uh, seventeen board memberships over a period of time. Is that right? Yes. So I've served on more than eighteen boards over a period of the last twenty three years. Um, Fantastic. So across a variety of sectors. So when we talk about this, you really know your stuff. And and as you were explained to me, not many people really talk about this. They talk about other things like you said, how not to go to prison, but they're not really talking about influence and persuasion in, in the boardroom. Why are you, what's led to you here, not just your own boardroom experience, but why are you now speaking about this? I think partly it's because... I'm a recycled civil engineer, if I could describe myself in such a a way. So I always wanted to build a better world in one way or another. And what I discovered as I went through my career was that you have more impact from management and then from the boardroom than you do in the actual projects themselves. And fortunately for me, I was reasonably good at the projects themselves and at management. And so I made my way into the boardroom at a fairly early age and almost by accident. So then I set out to learn and to see, well, this is a wonderful new platform. How do I make it work for me? How do I have more impact? 
How do I do the things I want to do and build the things I want to build? And so I set about getting a lot of qualifications as well as a lot of experience and just found that I totally love what I do. Yeah, fantastic. Are are there things that you find are perhaps unique to boardroom situations that a lot of people perhaps aren't aware of? Mm, It's probably one of the only places where you can be personally liable, even if you're not personally culpable. So in other words, you can be held to account for the faults of the organization, even if you didn't know about them, or even if you voted against them and your co-directors voted for them and they therefore were made to happen. So it's a very high stakes game. Mm. It's not without risk. But that aside, it's a very invigorating and exciting game. And it's one that I love. Do do those things have any kind of impact on the ability or desire to influence in the boardroom then? Yes, definitely. You do find that your average company director is relatively cautious and particularly your chairs, if they're good, will have a great deal of regard for building consensus, having everybody agreed around a course of action even if they didn't like it at first, accepting that, yes, I'll follow it, I'm happy, I can see the good things in it, and I'll contribute an awareness of the risks and the potential downsides. Yeah. So it's a true team environment. Now, I know one of your goals has been helping like, directors and boards to become more effective and, and, I guess, more efficient perhaps in their communication and things like that. So what... What really helps in those situations? How does somebody be more influential in the boardroom? This is a difficult, I mean, this is the $10 billion question, isn't it? Because you cannot be any use at all in the boardroom unless you can influence the other directors with your knowledge or your passion or your vision. So you have to be able to influence your colleagues. If you can't, you're probably safer not being there and you're probably not going to enjoy it. So building influence is what all good directors do. And if you've got influence in the boardroom, you've got influence over the company and some companies are immensely powerful. What are some examples from your own experience where you've seen that in action, where people have needed to be influential and perhaps you can even include in that some examples of where that's been effective and where it hasn't Mm. the typical one is the person who joins a board very often members associations so things like the institution of civil engineers and the association of chartered accountants people like that somebody will have a wonderful idea let's do this this is wonderful They'll get a head of steam and build a platform of support and they'll get elected to the board. And then something very scary happens because they are now one vote on a board of many votes. And if nobody else wants to side with them and vote with them, all the people who elected them are going to be very disappointed because nothing's going to happen. So you'll often see people who join a board saying, look, I I want to create a circular economy. I want to make sure everything's recycled or I want to be on this board to make sure that the board is 50 percent female. And so are all of the executive ranks of the company. And if you're going to bring about that sort of huge change, you really need to be able to bring the rest of the board with you and to have them see the benefits, but also trust that you have what it takes to make that happen. Yeah. So, for my guidance. When you were first in the boardroom, as someone who now has served on 17 boards, I'm guessing you, you found your place there and you found your way through doing that. But was that initially there? Or did you already have the groundings of being a, a great board member who would enjoy that environment? Or is that something that built over your experience? It really built over my experience. My first board was an absolute almost mistake. I was sent from the UK by a firm of consulting engineers to run the Madrid office, which was fine. But when I got there, I was signing papers. And one of the papers I signed said, oh, resident director. So I quickly crossed that out and said, you know, 
No, I'm the regional engineer for Spain and Portugal. And the accountant had hysterics and said, no, no, you can't cross that out because you are actually on the board of this company and you are the resident director. Wow. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, oh, because it's so expensive to go overseas and catch people. So we have one director in the country. And if the company does the wrong thing, you go to jail. And that's a very strong incentive for the company doing the right <laughs> thing. Right. Yeah. And I thought about that and I immediately said, oh, but you know, I have a boss. And he said, yes, he's on the board too. I said, oh, who else is on the board? And then it turned out it was my boss's boss. And I said, well, that's brilliant because I'll just do what they say. And then I'll be perfectly safe. I thought I was Oliver North, who was a famous colonel in the American army who had signed orders for Indeed. everything he did. But the accountant just looked at me and he said, no, Julie, with a director, you can't do what other people tell you. You have to make up your own mind. And this is one of the things I love about the boardroom is that there's a legal requirement to bring diligent, specific and independent inquiry to the matters that you're deciding upon. Yeah. And it just means that you have that curiosity of, well, how does this work? What should I do? Is there a better way? Who does it help? Who does it harm? Where's the support? So, yeah, it's great, great fun if you're a bit of an independent thinker. Right. You got thrown in the deep end then when it came to, to being on a board, but it seems that you found your feet very quickly with that. What perhaps were some of the biggest lessons that you realized early on that you needed to put in place to be effective in the board? I think the first thing was that you really have to get ahead of the play. There is no offside rule in boards. So what one of the first things that happened was the accountant came to me with a set of accounts and some papers. And the papers were the minutes of a board meeting that said we'd approved the accounts and he was going to lodge these accounts tomorrow. And I said, but we haven't had the meeting. I'm not signing that. He said, well, if you don't sign it, you're automatically in trouble because it has to be lodged tomorrow. So I quickly phoned my boss and luckily his boss was in town and we managed to have the meeting and we changed the date of the meeting to the day of the meeting rather than the one that the accountant had plucked from the ether. But it taught me that there are people who will put a veneer of correct governance over the top of a complete absence of governance. But the other interesting thing was that when I started talking with my boss's boss, I got a very different perspective than when I just talked with my boss because he had a wider view. He had a different range of concerns my boss was very interested in how much money is coming out of Spain and back to head office. His boss was much more inclined to consider, well, in the long term, how do we build a sustainable company? How are we going with recruitment? How are we going with retention? So the quality of the discussion and the deeper understanding of a bigger picture is something that is very addictive and most directors really enjoy it. And the other thing, of course, was that I, I started to look ahead and say, OK, well, what's the next challenge and what's coming up next? So you become, on the one hand, more strategic, but on the other hand, much more careful that you're building that scaffolding of support that's going to allow you to build the structures you want with the company. Right. So it's important to have a foundation for your influence as well. And I think that that's important mm. in many parts of life. But influence does require some level of foundation. Generally, it's uh, not always the same, exactly the same as persuasion, although persuasion can flow from it. But gaining influence with people and with organizations does require that. You mentioned about about that and being strategic as well. What in your experience really helps define someone or show that someone is being strategic? It's a good question because every director and every aspiring director will tell you that they're strategic. Of course we're strategic. And it, it's a great claim to make on your CV or on your headline on LinkedIn. But for me, I will often say, where have you been 
that people were going in one direction and you were able to show them a better direction and take them in that way to a better outcome. Yeah. And I'm, I work on that. If you've done it in the past, you can probably do it again. But if people can't come up with an example, then I consider that maybe they're not that strategic or not that influential. Is that something you feel that people can train themselves or be trained to become? Or is it one of those, well, either you are or you're not? No, I think you can train yourself to become strategic and you can train yourself to become influential. The question is, do you want to? Right. Do you want to be constantly making the wrong decisions? Because strategy is all about the future and the future hasn't happened yet. Um, so you're going to get it wrong. And one of the things that Bob Garrett says, he's a governance professor from the London School of Economics. He wrote the book, The Fish Rots from the Head. A very good book. But one of the things he says is that directors have to be sufficiently connected to the company that they can test their decision making and move rapidly when required. And that's a really good test because if you're making decisions about the future, which hasn't happened yet, you're going to get a lot wrong. Don't let anybody tell you that they always have a crystal ball view, not even engineers. Yeah. One of the things that in my experience where people tend to get stuck in those particular areas are certain kinds of logical fallacies, like sunk cost fallacies, and being just one example of that, or recency biases or confirmation biases. Is that something that you help people to, to work with? Like how do you get people to see whether they are being as effective and strategic as possible? Mm. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about diversity on boards. And it's been a little bit hijacked about women on boards, but that's only one aspect of diversity. So when we talk about getting a board to be able to make the big strategic decisions and take the company forwards and people being able to move the company in new and different ways, you're looking for people who've got credibility with the other directors. And that comes from a track record of doing what you say you will do. It comes from a track record of having some success and influence in the past. It comes from a track record of having a clear vision for what it is you're trying to do. And it comes from having a very reasonable plan of, well, if we do this first and that next and something else afterwards, that'll get us moving in the right direction. Yeah. So as long as you've got that basis those four key things you stand a reasonably good chance of being able to influence people but then you want to get people who different backgrounds so the accountants will influence you one way the engineers another the marketers yet another the educators yet another and you want to be able to bring it all together so that the sum of the parts is, is a whole that is vastly greater. Yeah. So the diversity is more diversity of thought and experience. Mm, I think so. Thought, experience, diversity of tenure. People don't talk much about that outside of very snooty governance circles. But when you're on a board, the idea is that some of your di and diversity as to whether you're independent or not independent, executive or not executive. But the diversity of tenure, it's often very good to have one or two directors who've been with a board for a long time. As people would say, they know where the skeletons are buried, but they've got a huge corporate history. They've got a feel for the culture. They've got instincts that have been honed over the years. And then you have other people who've joined because they've got a specific technical skill or a specific experience that's going to be useful and valuable. And they might only be on the board for a couple of years whilst that skill is assimilated, the management team build up their strength and oomph in doing whatever it is you want to do, and then those people move on. So managing the different tenures of the different directors and making sure that everybody's making a good leadership contribution and everybody's having influence is quite a trick. For sure. And I think perhaps the, the common conceptions about, or perhaps misconceptions about the boardroom are what we tend to see in 
TV and films, which are usually where it's wheeling and dealing and backstabbing and sneaking and conniving and um, all these sorts of things on where, where the reality perhaps, and certainly for, from what you're saying, is much more having to work together and having to uh, be accountable to each other and try and make the best decisions for everybody, not just for what serves one person's purpose. Yes, and that being accountable to each other, being collegiate, doesn't mean being nice or even always totally polite. Most directors are very polite, but not all of them. Right. And there are times when you have to say, look, with respect, I really can't agree. My experience leads me to a completely different conclusion. How do we move forward from here? And that is quite rude and quite confronting no matter how you say it, because basically you're telling the other person that what they're suggesting doesn't pass muster with you. Right. So managing to disagree without being disagreeable, managing to play the issue and not the person, managing to, I use a little technique that I call the ladder of inference, and you can find TEDx videos about it and things, but it's about what are the facts what are the clear facts? And of the clear facts, which are the ones that I've selected to notice? Because there'll be others out there that didn't fit my confirmation bias. Then what are the assumptions I'm making? Because a lot of what we say are actually deeply held assumptions, but they're not facts at all. We just hold them to be true because it's useful to us. And what would happen if I recognized those assumptions for hypotheses instead of facts. What does this mean? Is it a benefit? Is it a threat? How can it be used? And so you, you move up the, the different rungs of the ladder until at the end you have a decision. But good directors will always, if they reach a disagreement that they can't solve, go back down a level mm. or maybe two levels so that you're constantly up and down your ladder I quite rudely talk about going up and down like a fiddler's elbow or a sailor with bunk beds. But you really do have to run up and down that ladder because your own assumptions come into play as well as everybody else's. And you'll get halfway to a decision and suddenly decide, discover that one of your key facts isn't actually a fact after all. Oops. Right. So, so it is important to, I guess, take a step back for yourself sometimes and, mm. and give yourself those overview, those time to think about it and to collect your thoughts and rationalize them in a way that's going to make sense in the situation as well. I wonder mm. whether you find you have had any particular experiences that you think are unique to being uh, a woman in what's generally considered uh, has been in the past and hopefully changing uh, a male dominated environment. Has there been anything that's been unique that have unique challenges, unique opportunities from that? I think as a female civil engineer, kind of hard to get taken seriously by the guys on site when you first arrive. They, they sort of look at you. You don't look like an engineer. You don't even sound like an engineer. You sound way too high pitched and girly. But once they realize that you actually know what you're talking about and that you can actually help them to do what they're doing. So usually on every board, building site, I would look for the foreman whose bonus was in jeopardy and say, right, what support do you need? What materials, what extra people, what datums and benchmarks and, and what arrangements, how can I help you make your bonus? And suddenly you have their attention. And then when you've gained their trust by making things hopefully a little bit better, you can start to move on to other people in the same organization on the same site. And I think something very similar happens with boards. I find that sometimes I'll appear on a board and people go, oh, she's that governance lady. Oh, she's going to be nothing but compliance and box ticking and dotting I's and crossing T's and telling us all to behave. Whereas I find that when I'm there, and I start asking a few questions about how things are working, what are the results of what we're doing, and people see that actually, no, there, there's some substance here. And this is the important thing. 
never ever join a board where you don't have something to contribute because if you've got nothing to contribute you're you're just going to be asking questions and irritating everyone right and there is a board for everybody so finding that board and being really clear these are my areas of expertise these are my core passions or these are the things i'm learning so that i can leverage my core passions closer to the boardroom is very very important there are so many people who just I don't think they aspire to the status. I think that's a disempowering assumption that we make about them. But they are so keen to have the influence of a board seat that they grasp seats that they really should not yet inhabit. Yeah. Rather than starting with ones where they can make a valuable contribution. And ideally you want when you finish your tenure everyone on that board saying, "Oh, yes, John was fantastic. Oh, John Ball. Yes, he came to us and he taught us all about being influential and he taught us about podcasting and he taught us about reaching our audiences and oh yeah, sure we'd recommend him to the board of the BBC or Canal Plus or whatever board you decided you wanted to go to next. But you'd probably be starting with community radio or a local TV channel. And so it's that whole question of, obviously you've started with the podcast, but that whole question of building your influence and constantly upping the ante to play a bigger game, getting parachuted in at the top is usually a recipe for disaster. And you see that with the children of billionaires all around. Of course. The world. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Too many examples of that. Uh, so it, it's interesting because I think people do consider being on a board an elevated status if you're on the board for something even if it's a local charity or like a hospital radio or whatever if you're on the board for it it's a status position or it has some those sorts of associations with it and i can really appreciate what you're saying that people may not be having that inner desire but if you get offered a place on a board you may get more carried away with thinking oh right that i'm valued people want me for this and make your decision based on mm. that rather than well what do I really have to offer them? What am I going to do? What opinions or how can I lead them or help them go in positive directions and, and grow and be of value to them? And I think that's great to encourage people to, to consider that, that the boards you get invited onto may not be right for you, or they may not be right for you right now. You may not be ready mm. for it. And, and often we don't stop and consider those sorts of things. We get swept along with the emotions. Yes. And, Boards are dangerous. As Spider-Man's Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility mm -hmm. and boards are very powerful. So being on the wrong board and there are unscrupulous people who will invite you onto boards knowing that there are risks that they themselves aren't taking, but they'll put you on there or they'll invite you onto the board if you make a sizable investment or they will invite you onto a board because they want to be the power behind the throne. So really doing your due diligence, if somebody offers you a board seat, the first thing to answer is, Ooh, why me? What is it uniquely about me that makes you think I'm the best person to fill that seat at this particular point in time? And if they haven't got an answer that really rings true to you, be very concerned. Yeah. If they've got an answer that rings true and you think, oh, I don't have the skills. I don't know how to read a set of accounts. Well, that's fine. Tell them you don't know how to read a set of accounts. Do some courses, sit down with the CFO, get people to talk you through that piece so that you can discharge your duty. Accounting's not that hard. I'm yeah. going to upset all the accountants, but it is actually mostly adding and subtracting. <laughs> Indeed. If you're multiplying and dividing, you're into financial analysis. So, it is a question of just learning, and most of us learn to add and subtract before we get out of primary school. Yeah, We can do it as adults. I really like what you're saying there. I like the, the whole thing of thinking about why you would be being asked. 
And one of the things that I often teach in terms of influence and persuasion skills is almost really a defense against other people's influence and persuasion, which is taking that step back to ask yourself, what is the other person's intention here? If someone says something to you that gets you to feel a certain way, a a particular negative way, it's worth having a think about what do you think their intention was? Was Was their intention to annoy you or to make you feel upset or to make you angry? And in certain situations, you may even ask them, what was your intention in saying that to get that clarity? Mm. And often people won't, won't have a good answer to that because people don't generally consider that they're going to get called on that or think about it. So you usually will get a true answer to that question if you get an answer at all. But it is valuable to think about that. And not enough people do. People just don't take those little little steps back to see a situation, helicopter above it and look on it and say, what's really going on here because when you're in it you don't see you don't see everything that's at play and we only see the behaviors right. we don't see the intentions and being very careful how you ask because if you ask somebody why did you say that it's a little bit threatening and confronting yeah. i'm really curious where were you coming from um, what was behind that remark particularly the extroverts in the boardroom because we speak because if we don't We're not really there, are we? Which is frightening for us. The introverts don't get that at all. But making sure that you are careful, I use a little model called WAIT, which is why am I talking? It's an acronym. And before I talk in the boardroom, I will sit down and say, right, why am I talking? What do I hope to achieve by asking a question? What's the best question to ask to achieve that? And Most of the time I'll get it wrong, but I'll be somewhere near where I need to be. And then I can refine it and get to the information I'm trying to uncover. And at that point, very often fellow directors will hop in and and start delving around into the new information with me. Or what will happen is you'll see the chair's subtle body language of sitting back and smiling, which is a go for your life, Julie. I like this. You're going somewhere. But reading, being very careful that you always have that permission to speak and that you are trying your best to ask the right first question because you will not, legally, in theory, you can ask as many questions as you like and you shouldn't stop asking until you're totally satisfied. Well, you try doing that in a three-hour board meeting with 12 people ain't going to work. Yeah. So you ask one question. It was not quite the question you should have asked. You ask another question. That was it. You're now cracked through the shell and into the topic itself and you're going where you want to go. You might ask a couple more questions to scope out, okay, well, how big is this? How important is it? Who's involved? What does it impact? And at that point, you start drawing back because management can't do anything while they're in the boardroom answering your questions. Yeah. And the board is not there to torture management, which is what you do if you keep asking them questions and they can't handle the answers. So you just ask a few questions and then you push it to, okay, well, what action is going to be taken? When's it coming back? What will we see? What will you do? And you move on. Yeah. So I always say you never get more than four questions in a row. If only we were all so considered in our communications, Julie, that would uh, make a big difference to life and the world. People often people often think I'm very quiet, and uh, the the reality is that the the wheels are always turning, the thoughts are always going on. I just don't put everything into words because I I do generally in life one of those people who I like to consider what I say and I don't like to just speak for the sake of speaking or just filling the air with my voice, and uh, so I always try to avoid that. I'm not saying I never do it, but uh, I'm generally considered quiet because it's not really quiet. I'm just maybe thoughtful and intentional with the communication that I have. And uh, yeah, I'm not really a small talk <laughs> kind of person. And I guess you don't really want that. You don't mm. really want someone in a boardroom who's going to be rambling, going around the houses, trying to come to some sort of question or something that's actually relevant. The people who just feel that any questions are good questions that we just keep asking, it does start to wear thin very quickly. So that that's particularly mm. interesting. I, I wonder 
for, for you then, why you made the decision to move into speaking about this and doing professional speaking work? It was an accident. I was working at the time for KPMG and I had a contract that said I was allowed to have three boards on the side as long as they were not clients or listed companies, which was fine. I was perfectly happy. I was sitting on two government boards and one not-for-profit and I had a full-time job. I don't know why I was happy. I was definitely overworked and overextended, but I was doing what I wanted to do. And then Enron happened. And in Australia, we had a company, an airline called Anset, and that collapsed. And there were all sorts of questions about auditors and distractions. And an edict came out from on high that nobody was allowed to be on boards. And I said, well, I am. It's in my contract. And they said, oh, yes, well, we'll we'll have to talk about that. We'll have to change it. And I said, no, because that's the other thing you'll find. If people are really strategic, they won't give up the future to hold on to the present. Right. So at a an age that with hindsight was really too young, I should have stayed another 10 years there. I left my day job and went to go on to boards. But what had happened is before I was at KPMG, I was a strategic planner for BHP. Everybody knew I loved strategy. Everybody knew I loved boards. And so people started asking me, come and talk to my board about strategy. Come and facilitate our strategic planning day and come and do some work for us. So I started building this business. And then the Institute of Company Directors said, oh, you know, we hear you talk about strategy and boards come and teach our strategy module for directors. And then could you teach the risk module? Because that's the flip side of strategy. So I suddenly found myself in a situation where I had a small portfolio of boards, which is still my overwhelming passion, and a business, which is also my overwhelming passion. And so being able to combine the two, and that's the other thing is good directors always have time in the diary because when things go pear-shaped, they go pear-shaped very quickly and one board with problems will take up 100% of your time. So you always want to have some things. Most directors have things that they can set aside and focus on their, their boards if need be. It's very bad to resign from the board that's going pear-shaped and focus on the ones that are going well. Your career is not going to go anywhere if you do that too often. Yeah, yeah. You're better off resigning the good ones and picking them back up later. I noticed that you speak very clearly and, and I would even say deliberately and strategically. Is that a skill that you learned in becoming a speaker or, or did you already have that communication style? I grew up as the expatriate child of expatriate workers. So I spent a lot of time translating. As a child, you learn languages much more quickly than other people, and you're very alert to nuance and fitting in and doing what everybody else does. So I did find myself from a very early age explaining to adults and my older sister which way was up and what was happening and what was good and what was bad and how to deal with things and generally was very confident at communicating as clearly as I could. And I find that particularly with international companies where you're communicating with people whose first language isn't English, then slowing down, understanding that they might have very different views about how you act in a group and what constitutes respectful behavior. So really stepping back, and yes, as I say, I use that weight model. Why am I talking? What's the best way to talk in this place with these people to achieve these outcomes? And yeah, I can crack jokes like every other engineer. They're just not funny because I'm not a comedian. <laughs> Some, something I, I, I work on myself. Uh, doing a, I'm doing a, a stand-up comedy program at, at the moment and uh, learning a lot from it and uh, really enjoying enjoying the experience. I'm hoping it will make my presentations funnier. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so to to sort of continue continue on from that then in terms of the the communication and the ability, 
I, I found that myself in, I, I often do group programs where we have an international group on there who don't necessarily have English as their first language. And I am naturally a fast talker. I like to go into the information as someone who's very, very deliberate what they say. I have a natural tendency to talk very fast and, and I like to communicate quickly. And, and I tend to have things straightened out in my head when I'm communicating so I know what I want to say. And I just kind of just want to get it out there, I suppose. And so you do have to take those steps back to slow yourself down and to help yourself be understood. You have to take it as your responsibility as a speaker that you are there to help your audience understand, not to just deliver in the way that is best and comfortable for you, but in the way that is about your audience and helping mm. them get what they need to, what what you want them to most take away, which isn't being impressed by how great you are as a speaker, but it should be about what they have learned from the experience of listening to you or what they what's useful or resourceful that they can put into action in some way in their life their business life and any other aspects so i think that's great that you that you bring that up because very few people really stop to consider that mm. when it comes and to that sorry, empathy yeah empathy yeah you've just got to have it you you cannot fake empathy the things you do to fake empathy generate empathy. So listening and watching and making sure that everybody feels heard and able to contribute. And I was talking with Ellie Mina, who's a Canadian governance expert, and he said something very interesting. He said, we always are quick to blame the chair when things go wrong in the boardroom. But the chair is just as capable of making mistakes as everyone else. And it's the job of everyone else to help the chair so that the mistakes they make aren't as bad as they could have been. And that whole idea of constant service to your fellows is an important one, especially when that service is often contradicting them and picking the scabs off their assumptions and saying, no, that's an assumption, not a fact. Yeah, which is important to do. And, and so many people, you rightly say, so many people keep quiet in those situations or almost mm. look forward to seeing somebody fail uh, and topple. And, and I know this is, uh, I don't know how it is in Australia so much, but I know in the UK, that's very common. And people will just keep quiet and, and let people fail away. Whereas how much nicer would professional culture be if we helped each other out or see that something's going the wrong way and take the risk of perhaps not being agreed with or maybe even getting shouted down in certain situations, but doing the right thing and helping people out rather than point scoring or waiting for someone else to fail so that you can step up or someone else gets to step up the ladder. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I hope that mm. more things are, are changing in that direction. When it comes to your speaking work, what do you love most about being a speaker? Now? I love that moment when, and I, I refer to it as the lights go on, when people exploring a problem and exploring a problem and exploring the problem, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's the answer. And even if the answer is not 100% clear, it's that sudden moment of shared certainty that I find probably more addictive than crack cocaine. It's just wonderful because it unleashes the power of the people, the group, and if you're a board, it unleashes the power of the company. And the limited liability company is probably one of the most influential inventions on earth. So, yeah, I, I just love those moments of recognition of this is what's going on or this is what will work or this is a good way forwards. Yeah. I, I often find myself working with clients who are looking to make the transition from maybe being on a board or maybe not even a transition, but a transition in their professional life to some degree from perhaps being a board member, a business owner, some executive position to becoming a speaker, a, a mentor, a trainer. Uh, what advice perhaps do you have for people who are considering that kind of transition? <laughs> Be very careful that you have a viable business model because it is very easy to spend all your time helping people and not earning money. 
make sure that you are always happy with what you're doing. There's something about some speakers, and you will feel it yourself, where you can see that they're on the stage, somebody's pressed go, and the tape is running and the words are coming out and the gestures are all in time and the slides are happening in the background, but that particular person is nowhere to be seen. There's just this husk on the stage going through the motions. And it's one of the saddest things to see. One of my friends, Michelle Bowden, who talks about persuasive presentations, she always says, if you're not nervous when you go on, you don't care enough. And so making sure that you, you do care, you care very deeply about the people you're talking with, you care deeply about the topics you're talking about. And the other thing is, don't believe your own brochures. I learn as much from the directors I mentor as they often do from me. There is always room to learn something. So that would be my advice. And the other advice would be seek out other speakers, join the Professional Speakers Association, learn what the ethos of the speaking industry is, make sure that you never stiff your speaking bureaus or clients because you can unwittingly set your career back 10 years by doing the wrong thing at the wrong time when that's something that would be reasonably acceptable in other types of business. Wise insights, and I hope people will be making notes. Of course, there'll be a transcript for this if people do, <laughs> if people want that and want to check through. Uh, but I really appreciate everything you shared. We've talked about influence in the boardroom. We've talked about being being persuasive. We've talked about authenticity and accountability. And we've talked about speaking and, and making those sort of moves from professional business life into other kind of professional business life of being a speaker and being an, an educator. And so really we've covered so many things that I love talking about in the show, which is why I've been so happy to, to have you on today. One thing I always like to ask my guests is for a resource or recommendation. Now, I know you mentioned a book earlier, but is, is there any particular books that, or resources that stand out for you that you think could be great to share with people? Obviously anything I've written. No, I would suggest looking at what you need and Bob Garrett's writing is very good. Patrick Dunn, who wrote a beautiful book called Boards, it's about fat. For those of you who are only listening because you're driving, I'm holding my fingers about four inches apart. The print's not exactly large, but it's a very good book. He wrote a book called Running Board Meetings, Eli Mina's 101 Boardroom Problems and How to Solve Them. There are a number of good books inside the boardroom by James Gillies and Richard LeBlanc. They would be my go-tos. Oh, and Boards That Lead, in fact, anything by Ram Charon. Um, Fantastic. Great. Great resources. And, of course, it would be remiss of me not to ask you which of your own writings perhaps might be most relevant or interesting to, to the audience. I would suggest, particularly if you're trying to work out whether this is for you, read my Dilemmas books. I have a book called Dilemmas, Dilemmas. I have a book called Dilemmas, Dilemmas 2. I'm not very imaginative. And I have a book called Not-for-Profit Board Dilemmas. But they are, unlike most government books, which are written for here's the regulations, here's the law, here's the theory, go away and apply it or they'll be written, this is my experience, this worked for me, go away and apply it. Those books are written very much from a, here's a situation. This is what's happening in this boardroom. And here are three different people suggesting how they would approach the solution. And the ones I love are the ones where all three of us completely disagree about what's really going on, what's the best way to handle it. And knowing the different people, I can thoroughly understand that it's, of course, Larry Steibel would walk up to the person in their golf club and have a face-to-face -face conversation about it. Of course, the other person would go through 
the lawyer and the accountant and would would use a lot of written and persuasive material. There's no right answer to a lot of these things because they are how people communicate with other people in order to build a shared understanding, in order to make a decision everyone can support. Yeah. And so I just love the variety that comes out of that. And if you're thinking about joining a board, reading books like that that tell you this is what happens in a real board. Another good one, of course, is they told me not to take that job by Reynard Levi. So everybody told him not to take that job and he took it. <laughs> if, if anyone is tuning in who is maybe thinking that they'd like to book you as a speaker or, or at least find out more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? Hit Google with a name like Julie Garland McClellan. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm on LinkedIn. I have my own website. Sorry, I don't understand. Google heard you. <laughs> Oops, when I said hit Google, Google went, no, don't hit me. Sorry, I don't understand. But no, don't hit Google. That would be very unfair on Google. It would. But yes, reach out to me any way that makes sense. So find your line, reach out and uh, fantastic. And know that uh, yep. given that you're one of a very, probably very small group of people who are talking on those particular topics, it uh, gives you a, a nice niche for people to be thinking, yeah, we could do with someone to speak about that. Judy, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you today. I've learned a lot. I'm sure anyone who's tuned in will have learned some stuff. Anyone who's thinking about being on a board now has some ideas what they should be thinking about. People who are on boards might be having some thoughts about how best to serve their board now. So I think you shared a lot of value today. Thank you so much for joining me as my guest on Speaking Influence. It's been a pleasure and a delight. I've enjoyed it and I've learned something too. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you are subscribed for more great content and guests. And remember, share the show with your friends. I hope there's at least one thing that you can take away from this episode and apply into your life, either personally or professionally. Remember, to know and not to do is to not truly know. Take that one thing and put it into action and feel free to get in touch and let us know how it went. Guests for the show are selected personally by me on the basis of adding great value and information to you. You won't find my guests pushing weird pseudoscience, unsubstantiated claims, or wacky spiritual beliefs on my show. That's one of my rules, and many potential guests have been turned away on that basis. With that said, I do not police the personal beliefs, spiritual or otherwise, of my guests or exclude them solely on that basis. I'm just very clear that my show is not a platform for promoting spirituality or pseudoscience. Podcasting is a very powerful medium and it seems to only be growing with sites like Facebook and Netflix even looking to get in on the action. You might be thinking of starting your own podcast or wondering how you can leverage the power of podcasts for your own personal or professional brand. Maybe you're thinking of doing both. If you want to talk with me about whether starting your own show is a good idea or how to be a superb podcast guest and increase sales leads and client flow for your own business or just raise your social profile, email me, john at presentinfluence.com and put the subject line, I'm pod curious and let's get you started. If you wonder where the majority of my guests come from, I do personally invite some of my guests through networking or discovering them through their books or content. However, the majority of my guests apply to be on the show. And the tool that has already enabled me to fill out my guest calendar until the end of the year is called Matchmaker FM. If you're looking for guests or you're looking to be a guest, this is the place to get yourself listed. Let their algorithm match you up with the perfect shows and guests for you. Would you like to join me live with my guests? If you would, make sure you're following me on social media. And if you want exclusive access to me and to my guests, sign up for one of our membership levels at Supercast. You will find my email address and all the links that I've mentioned in the show notes for the show. Join me next time for more amazing guests and talk about speaking influence. Go and make great things happen.